So please give a warm welcome to John Moonham. Thank you. Well, this is a lunch and learn, so hopefully the lunch is good because I'm not sure how much you're going to learn, okay? Um, the first thing that I do want to uh, talk about is um, I, I am biased um, in regards to historic rehab. That's what I do professionally. Um, as a developer, generally almost all of my projects are historic tax credit projects, but also I'm biased because um, I do live in the city of Winchester and I do represent the city. So at the end of the slide presentation, I'm going to show a number of projects that um, have helped sort of reinvigorate the downtown area, but also not, not just big, but also um, some smaller projects that have been instrumental, I think, in revitalizing our, our downtown core. Some of those uh, happily partnered with the Shockey companies, um, and obviously this building would not have been able to be um, re rehabilitated without the use of tax credits. So, um, but also I want this to be as interactive as possible. So I know I have kind of a, uh, a mixed group of professionals. So has anyone here actually used tax credits on any project before? I know John has, and obviously we've worked with Shockey. So um, I'm going to keep this at a pretty high level because uh, there are really lots of things I could get in the weeds about, but I want to be able to answer questions. So please do me a favor and stop me because I don't want to just drone on and talk to you guys. So if there's something that I say that you may not understand or if I use an acronym, please um, don't hesitate to raise your hand so I can uh, make sure that this is as interactive and educational as possible. And also, just because of the group, I'm going to keep as much focus on um, Virginia tax credits as much as possible because the vast majority of, uh, of projects uh, cannot use federal credits um, just because of the limitations of uh, who the investors are. Hey, how are you? Doc? How are you? Um, the, the first thing that I wanted to make sure that everybody kind of understands, everybody kind of hears, how can I use tax credits? Um, what do they mean? What are they? Um, a tax credit really... Uh, fundamentally reduces a taxpayer's tax obligation. It's more than just a tax deduction. So if you own a home and you're deducting the mortgage uh, interest or your property taxes, that just kind of reduces the amount of the income uh, that you have that's then taxed. A tax credit actually reduces the amount of tax liability that you have to the IRS or to Virginia. So in that instance, it's actually more valuable because it's generally a dollar worth of Tax credits is worth a, uh, a dollar worth of your actual cash that you would pay to the governments. So if you have a mortgage interest, generally that's 30 to 40 cents versus a dollar of tax credit. So using tax credits is a lot more um, economically beneficial to anybody. Um, there are multiple types of uh, preservation focused tax at federal and state levels. These are mostly historic tax credits. Uh, there are some other programs and uh, tax abatement programs at the federal and state level, but generally uh, you, you just see tax credits for the federal and state. For local, um, and I've kind of so, I've taken my experience from Winchester, um, a lot of localities have tried to figure out ways to um, stimulate economic revitalization in their downtown areas. So a lot of different communities in Charlottesville, Winchester, um, Stanford, have created a number of programs such as property tax abatement for 10 years. So like in Winchester, if you were going to revitalize or, these are eligible for lots of different uh, projects, but if you're going to revitalize a building, um, they would basically uh, freeze your tax assessment as it is today, so any new value that you've created would not be taxed for property tax purposes for the 10 years, so that's a pretty big economic incentive. Um, additionally, there are re renovation incentives for derelict buildings, I believe in the city of Winchester. If you have what's considered to be a derelict building and, and you're, you acquire it, you can get a lot of your building permit fees reimbursed to you, so it's a way to stimulate some, some buildings that may not have been um, interested by, by developers. <laughs> Additionally, there are density bonuses available, so if you could traditionally maybe only do three or four units, um, there's additional bonuses if you're doing a historic rehab project where you may be able to you know, fit another two or three units in as well. So from a development perspective, it becomes more profitable and more economically viable to do a, a project. And then the last that you see a lot is, is either a facade loan program or a facade grant program. And generally those are just to improve the facades. Um, the city of Winchester has a low interest loan that's available over a period of five years, but it's used for you know, property owners, particularly in the downtown mall, who want to put new canopies or repaint or do things that, that you know, basically would show uh, their building a lot better. Um, you know, Village Square, they, they did a, they used the facade loan program to install their canopies and some of their fencing. So 
Um, these are ways for localities to be involved in the process as well. John? Is there a difference between a homeowner versus a business? Um, for the local taxes? Any of them. Yes. Um, the, the federal credits are not available for um, what I'd say um, homeowners. The state, there's, there's definitely a difference, and we're going to talk about um, the differences in, 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 between a homeowner and an, an, an investor. For the local, I think that um, I'm not sure about all the programs. They're generally driven towards commercial. There are a number of programs for home ownership as well. Um, any questions on this? Okay. Uh, so there are two types of credits um, for, for tax credit purposes, and I'm going to mostly, again, focus on state credits because a lot of projects are not going to be eligible for federal credits. Generally, for federal tax credit projects, you, you see... Um, the vast majority of the work that I do or the projects that I work on, um, we, send it, we, we call what's syndicating the credits or we monetize them. So um, generally a project or a professional or developers can't use all of the federal credits. So we find third-party investors who can use them, whether it's a bank or an insurance company or a you know, large um, corporation who can use the credits uh, for their own tax purposes. We actually syndicate them or monetize them. So. For instance, you may be able to get 84 or 85 cents on the dollar for that, and we're able to subsidize um, our, our projects by syndicating the credit. So it makes a project that maybe would, would not be able to do, you know, be able to, to to be accomplished normally. We're able to accomplish that because of historic tax credit investors. Um, but the, for the federal credit, there's two types of credits. There's one that's um, the standard credit, which is a 20% rehab tax credit. And basically, if you're a certified um, structure and, and certified historic um, district, you're eligible to get a 20% credit. You generally need to be within the period of significance for the federal credit, which means the period of significance is the age of the building, and every locality has a different period of significance. So, for instance, the city of Winchester is updating their period of significance to be in the 1960s. So, you know, as you think about whether your building's historic or not, um, I think a little bit of a change in the mindset needs to be happening by both developers, <coughs> local governments, and the state governments because what is now historic or 50 years old may not seem to be historic, but you know, it doesn't need to be a building built in the late 1800s or the early 1900s. I'm working on a building in, um, on Boscallen Street that was built in the 1950s, and it's actually deemed historic. So we just got to kind of get out of the mindset and, uh, of thinking about what's old or what's historic and what needs to be preserved. Um, and then there's also a 10% rehab credit, and this is for the, the rehab of any non-historic commercial building that was built prior to 1936. So Congress is looking at updating this date because obviously that's extremely old, um, uh, more than 70 years old. So we're, we're actually trying to change some legislation to make that be basically on a 50-year rotating basis so that the, um, the period is updated every year rather than saying it's just 1936. So for that credit, all you have to do is have a building that's older than the 1936 and um, not necessarily be in a, a federal historic district. I'm going to uh, talk a lot about the 25% the credit uh, for Virginia. Um, and this basically um, is, is applied to historic buildings that are listed on the Virginia Landmarks Register and it, or is certified as a contributing structure in a district uh, that is listed or that buildings are deemed eligible. So um, there are lots of buildings that may be historic, but are maybe not on this landmarks registry. So a lot of times um, historical architects like Moral Calbian um, or, or the, the Traceries Group need to be engaged uh, for homeowners particularly to get your building or your, your house listed on these so that you can become eligible. Sometimes just because of the location of where your building is, you may just be within the district. Um, so if you're downtown Winchester, generally you're going to be within the historic district for the, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, now, one other thing I want to make sure that folks understand is the, the local uh, historic district where you would be under kind of the purview of the BAR can, can also be different from what the national federal historic district is versus the state districts or the local. So as you're going through this, um, if, you're, if you're looking to do any project, I generally recommend that you have a lot of interaction with the Department of Historic Resources in, in Richmond, or that you, um, you, know, you engage an architect or an arch architectural historian like Morale who can provide you some co consultation so that they can guide you through this process. 
not that it's um, difficult to do on your own, but it's generally helpful to have someone that's been through the process before. Um, again, it doesn't need to be on the register. It just needs to be considered to be eligible. And then the Virginia Historic Tax Credit is uh, um, equals 25% of what's called the total qualified rehabilitation expense. Um, so I'm going to explain what that means in a second. But that's generally how you determine how much of your expenses that you've incurred are eligible for credits for you to be able to use on your tax returns or to be able to use with an investor. And then as part of this process, like all good governmental uh, processes, there's a little bit of bureaucratic work that you have to do. There's a three-step um, application process that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but generally, it's not that cumbersome to, to deal with. Um, it's, it additionally, again, like I said, if you are working with an architect or working with an architectural historian or a consultant like me, um, it's generally something that's, that's pretty easily done. Um, so, but if you're a homeowner or you're looking to do something on your own, um, generally, again, the state or local representatives are excellent to work with. The other thing I wanted to point out was in, Virgi uh, in Virginia, the, the Department of Historic Resources is broken up into different localities. So our local representative is Dave Edwards, and he's based in Stephen City. So he's very accessible. Um, so if you ever have questions or you, you wanted to think about doing a rehab of your house or of a commercial building you own, um, that's a great resource, and it's local as well. Um, just to talk a little bit about the Department of Historic Resources, again, they are instrumental for Virginia projects. Um, they're generally the point of contact for property owners. Um, they'll provide all the ap uh, application processes, um, all the programs. Everything is on the web now, obviously. So um, if you go to their website, you'll find lots of good information, and it kind of walks you through um, from a very high-level perspective of what's important and what you need to think about. Um, there, there are three parts to the application, like I talked about. Um, the first part is called a Part 1, and that basically determines if your building is, is a certified structure. Again, that's important because if you're not certified, then you're not eligible for credits, and then you have to work to apply to be on the certification. Um, so that's sort of the step one. So you submit that to Richmond. They review your application. Generally, it takes 30 to 60 days, depending on how much work they have going on. And then they get back to you with either, yes, you're a certified structure, or no, you're not. Here's what you need to go do. If you pass the Part 1 application, then you then work on what's considered to be the Part 2. And this is probably the most critical piece and probably the most time-intensive this is where you actually will show the improvements that you're going to make to your properties. So if you're renovating your house or if you're doing a commercial project, you're going to need lots of detailed drawings and pictures. And there's generally interaction once you've submitted this with Richmond because, you know, a lot of times they'll ask a question about, well, what's this window? And, you know, because they're working off of an application rather than actually visiting the site, there, there generally is a lot of email traffic or, or phone calls that are required. I mean, and sometimes they, they will say, well, get, you know, gosh, I like this piece of your, your design, but I think you need to change this. So you need to do an amendment to your application. So that can take a little bit of time. But the part two is the most critical piece because if you've designed your building or you've, you've done too much work, then potentially they could de deny your application and you won't be able to use tax credits. Uh, generally, they're, they're very good to work with. Um, sometimes, like in any instance, um, you could have one person that you're working with that has a, an affinity for windows, so they may be very interested in your window design and may not care as much about the exterior. You might deal with one group that really cares about the facade but doesn't care as much. So sometimes it's the luck of the draw, but generally they're easy to work with. And if you want to appeal at any time, you know that's always a, a possibility as well. The other good thing about Richmond is they have monthly open houses. So if you wanted to go down to Richmond and you know, basically discuss your project before you got started or before you went through the application process, that's a way, you know, it is a couple hours trip out of your way, but at least it will save you time from having to go through the process and recreating the wheel. Um, so, and they, they're pretty open about what they'll, they'll do or not do. So I found that to be an extremely helpful exercise because they will give you immediate feedback. So instead of having to wait the 60 or 90 days, They'll tell you what they think about your design or what, what they would suggest that you do as part of your application. So whether you're renovating your house or you're renovating a, a small building or a commercial project, I always recommend going to go in the open houses. So the, the part two is, like I said, the, the most important part, I think, generally because, again, that's your entire design and what you're going to be constructing. And then the part three is the final part, and that basically is your proof to them of what you've done. So they... They get the Part 3 application, you show them your pictures, your finished product, 
And now they actually provide, um, or they require it, an inspection by one of their examiners. So they will come up and they will actually physically see what you've done to your building to determine whether you've, you've met all the criteria that you said you were going to do in part two. Um, this is generally for investors, if you're participating with an investor in a project, um, this is the most critical piece because without a part three, your investor won't contribute the rest of their capital to the project. Um, so that's generally um, uh, one of the, the major conditions to, to the tax credit process. Um, but the part three is when the credits would be eligible, uh, one of the main pieces of when the credits would be eligible. John? Yeah? You mentioned the rest of their capital. Excuse me. Yeah. What, what portion of the investor's capital do you get to use as your working capital versus the final investment? Uh, great, very, very good question. Um, for a federal historic tax credit project, you generally see it structured where the investor will um, be a participant in the very beginning. So they have to be in before the CO, and you want them in as early as possible. It's generally 20 to 30 percent. And then the rest of it will come when, when the CEO is finished, the cost certification is done, and the credits are actually legally delivered. For state projects, we generally see, um, and, and for, you know, I'm going to only speak to Virginia, but generally it's a very low um, capital contribution to the partnership. So maybe a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars, depending on the size, and then all of the rest of it's done at the end. But it's it's it, that's all negotiable, and it generally will affect the credit price as well. But great question. Um, all sort of all all of these part three, uh, part two, part one um, decisions are made in writing, so you will get a copy of these, and you always want to keep these in your file. Um, and then what happens is once everything's been approved by the Department of Historic Resources. They will ship everything over to the Virginia Department of Taxation because they actually will be the final approver of your credits. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yep. Part one of mm -hmm. the application yep. gets filled out and sent in before you get a certificate of occupancy. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So that's suppose you're already occupying. Okay. That's okay. So uh, that's called a rolling rehab. So if you have a building that you you already are functioning in and you want to use credits. <laughs> You would still go through the process. You would just fill out the part one to make sure that your building was eligible. Um, and so basically your credits would only be, the, the only pieces of your, your uh, project that would be eligible would, would be for those that are new. So if you're putting in a new HVAC system or you're doing some interior renovations or things like that, then those, only those pieces would be um, eligible for your credits. And you would, you would have that discussion in your part two. But you can, you can occupy a building um, while you're going through the tax credit project. Um, any questions on this? DHR plays a huge role, and, and again, if you're doing this on your own, I recommend that you have regular conversations with them just because you want to make sure that you're doing this right so that you don't jeopardize your credits. Please. Please. You should probably know this, but a historic district versus a historic place. What, what is the, for the National Register? Uh, that's actually, <coughs> uh, that's just for the state. Um, again, you could be you could be a historic building, but not on the historic registry. Um, so you could, you know, you could be, in, in, you know, in Clark County somewhere, um, and not technically, there, there may not be a map to create a historic uh, district there, but you could be deemed a historic building. So that's technically a historic place. Okay. Again, so the Virginia Department of Taxation, they play a huge role. Um, they will review um, a lot of the things that happen with the actual credits themselves. Uh, for larger projects, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, in all federal projects, you have to have a cost certification audit done by a third-party CPA firm. So they generally review those, and they'll sign off on them before they issue any um, of the tax credits. So the basic rules, I'm going to skip, uh, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit, so I'm going to skip that slide, sorry. Um, again, you know, the building has to be considered, for the Virginia credits, has to be considered to be a certified structure on the Landmarks Registry. Um, the Department of Historic Resources must approve and certify all rehab projects seeking the 25% credit. And uh, we, they also need to uh, review the application to make sure that, that your building is eligible and then that you've met all the standards from the Interior Department. Sorry, I think I had some extra slides here. I don't have an assistant anymore being on my own, so sorry, this is all good. Um, a couple thresholds, just to answer your question earlier, John. Um, so for federal credits, you have to be a commercial project. So you have to, you couldn't have, um, you know, tax credits for your 
home residents to qualify for federal credits. Uh, for state credits, that's not the, the, the way that you can operate. Um, in Virginia, I just want to make one uh, other little shout out to Virginia. Virginia probably has the best state credit project or state credit program in the United States. It's extremely um, uh, successful. It's been able to help renovate lots of different buildings, but they have lots of good rules. It's very friendly towards projects and investors. So that's why Virginia, you've seen a lot of historic renovations with, throughout our state. So it's, uh, it's a very, very good program, um, and we've always kind of been in the forefront in the United States. Um, so for Virginia credits, um, rehabilitation expenses for owner-occupied uh, structures, and these would really um, be what I would consider to be whether you own your house or you are currently in there yourself. So if you had an architectural firm and you owned a building, that's considered to be owner-occupied. If you owned a building and leased it to third-party people, then that would be what's considered to be an other eligible structure. So for owner-occupied structures, at least 25% of the assessed value of the buildings for local rehab, uh, for local real estate tax purposes, uh, you must meet a, th a threshold of 25%. So, for example, if this building were assessed for $200,000, $100,000 of it was for land, and $100,000 was it for your building, 25% of your total expenses that were eligible would need to meet, uh, to meet the test would need to be at least $25,000. So again, it's based on the building value of the year preceding um, when you start your rehab. So if we started rehab in 2013, we'd have to go back to our 2012 assessment and look at the buildings, uh, the building value on the local Winchester um, tax registry. Does that make sense? Byron. John, and you're okay with using the local assessment for that? You don't need any other appraisal or anything? No, that's actually the, the state rule is you okay. use the, the local real estate assessment okay. to determine value. The, the tricky part can be to go back, sometimes the assessors don't always have, or you know, sometimes you lose your bill, is to go back and actually find what the value is. And, and you do have to segregate out your land value versus your building value. So sometimes people will see the value and go, gosh, I can't achieve $150,000 on a $300,000 building. Well, that's because a lot of times you forget to segregate the land, which can be 20 to 30% of your total value. Somebody have to hear about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I misunderstood you. You, okay. you weren't saying that uh, you had to go back to the original. No, it's the preceding year before the rehab starts. Oh, okay. And then, so for other projects, so if you owned a building and then you were leasing it to, um, up for apartments or for whatever other purposes, that's a 50% test. So the threshold is just a little bit higher if you're doing what, what are considered to be investment properties versus owner-occupied properties. So the 25% is really helpful for people who own their home and they're looking to renovate, or if they own their own building as a you know, commercial tenant. Um, again, they're, they're trying to help out uh, the folks that actually are in their houses or whatever else. So, uh, and then a building is considered to be placed in service for tax credit purposes when the appropriate work has been completed to allow occupancy of the entire building or of the identifiable portion of the, of the construction. So back to your question, if you're occupying the building and you're trying to put in a new HVAC system or you're trying to renovate new windows or whatever it may be for historic tax credit purposes, that's okay. That will be placed in service when you're finished and you've received all your tax credit applications. So even though you're in your building, that specific piece of your application or your renovation is what's actually considered to be the new occupancy. Is there any difference in uh, the amount or the percentage uh, that's eligible between a building that's used for commercial purposes and a building that is occupied and used by a nonprofit organization? No real difference um, for um, the difference really becomes so. For example, if you're a nonprofit organization, you can't you can have your building and your um, your expenses be considered to be tax credit uh, eligible, but you can't use them yourself if you're tax exempt. So you would want to syndicate those to monetize the the economic value. So um, it has to be probably to a high enough threshold where an investor. Is worth it's worth to them to go through a little bit of the brain damage to go through with a tax with a tax exempt entity, and generally you you want to have at least fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars minimum of, of state credits before an investor will participate. Now, I would say that if you 
have benefactors or other people as a tax exempt entity who may be willing to take the credits and to participate, maybe able to lower that threshold, but just normal projects, you need it to be smaller. Um, for commercial purposes, um, if, if you're an investor, you know, generally you wouldn't do this if you owned a home and you were trying to renovate it, but if you're doing smaller projects, like I'm renovating a, a project on Boscowan Street, I'm, I'm only going to use state credits for that. Um, and so there's probably, I'm going to just guess, there's probably around seventy-five dollars to $100,000 worth of state credits. So I'll bring an investor into my partnership with me, and they will participate in the credit. So it just depends. Uh, again, I don't have any benefactors who want to help me out or participate um, unwillingly unless there's an economic incentive. But as a nonprofit or a tax exempt entity, you may find folks on your board or contributors who may want to participate so you can lower the threshold. Not, and then they, and then they will, you can transfer their tax credit to the benefactor. Right? You can. Right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about taxes and entities in just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Would you care to comment, or if you have, you may not have that. You, so you're using mm -hmm. state credits on your project. Yeah. But you chose not to do federal. Yeah. Why did you not use federal? This didn't really work? Um, I, I could have used federal. So um, for my project, I'm actually condoing um, a uh, a couple okay. sections of it, right. and so for federal purposes, um, so if you do a federal historic tax credit project, you're an investor, and you have to stay in the project for five years, and so for five years, you can't exit, you can't change ownership, you can't do anything, so it's a long window of time, so I couldn't condo that space right. to help me sort of recoup some cash. For Virginia, we don't have the same rules. There's not a, a, a specific period of time where an investor has to stay in. So I can actually condo, um, but I can also have tax credit participants or investors is what we would call them. Uh, and, and in our world, we don't talk about selling the credits. You're an investor in the project. Um, there's been a lot of court cases that have kind of batted around using the word sales of credits. So if you're ever talking to folks, you want to say that you want to invest in my tax credit project. Um, so um, for any other questions while we're going? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> does it have to be... An entire a full renovation or rehabilitation, or can you do partial? You can do partial. Uh, so if you are going to buy a building, let's say for my building it's three floors, and let's say that for economic purposes or just whatever, I only wanted to renovate one at one floor at a time, and I want to do it over a period of years. In Virginia, you can do it's called a rolling rehab, so you can you can phase it. It's called a phase <coughs> project, and you can do it over sixty months. And so when you're submitting your part two. There's a, actually a box that you would check to say, I want to do a phase project. That way, they, they look at your entire project, they know what you're going to do, they will approve it, and then you, as you're submitting your, your part three for the different phases, they kind of can keep an eye on what you're doing, but you're eligible to get those credits for those particular phases that you're working on. But it, there is a time frame of five years that you That's have a 60-month period, yeah. Um, and there's, there are some other rules about, sometimes it's 24 months and sometimes it's 60. I don't want to get into to that with you, but I can talk to you all fine about that. Um, let's see. And then, so the, the credits are claimed in the year that the rehab is completed. So let's say, for example, you started a project today, but you actually didn't get your finalization of your occupancy permit or whatever you needed to until January 2014. Well, then those are 2014 credits. So even if you did all your work in the preceding year or 2013, it's deemed to be eligible for credit purposes in the year that you actually complete it and you get your CO, your certificate of occupancy, and your part three. So it's pretty important to, to yeah. John, is the CO the trigger for completion? Generally, um, you can have a temporary CO uh, as well, so those qualify. Um, it's basically when the, when the final permits are issued, um, you also hear a term called substantial rehabilitation or substantial completion. Those are generally, if you just want the building to be occupied, or you want the HVAC system to be turned on, or, or whatever, something that's triggering sort of a finalization of the process. Yeah? Um, I'm still back on your investors. Okay. I, I'm trying to understand how this works. Okay. How, how do you determine how much credit the investor gets? I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, yeah. But that's a fantastic yeah. question. Um, and then, let's see, so in Virginia, um, if you cannot use the full amount of credit, you, can, uh, you can't go backwards. For federal credits, you can actually go back one year, but in Virginia, you can only carry the full the credit. So if you're a homeowner, let's say that you have taxable income of $5,000 a year from 
um, your wages and salary or whatever else it may be, but you, your project generates credits of $20,000, you would then just use those credits for the next four years. So you wouldn't pay Virginia income tax for a couple of years. Um, so you can use it and you get to keep them for a long time, which is good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tax exempt entities. I guess we have at least one. Is there any other tax exempt entities that are looking to do projects? Yes. Okay. So those are a little bit complicated, um, and I can talk to you after this if, if you have detailed questions. I don't mind doing that. For tax exempt entities, there's um, a couple of different structures that you have to create. Um, basically, you have to create a little bit of a lease between your tax exempt entity and, a, and a, what's considered to be a for profit LLC, because only um, companies that pay taxes can use the credits, obviously. So um, there's a little bit of work that needs to be done on the legal end. Nothing that's, that we haven't, that my team and myself have not done before, but it's a little bit of work, but it's generally very good. Um, uh, municipalities have used tax credits, so in Warren County, um, tax credits were used. Uh, the Hanley High School renovation state credits were used. So there are mechanisms for tax exempt entities to do that. Sometimes it's a little bit of work because you have to explain it to your board, you have to have a little bit of um, operating agreements and legal um, contracts between a couple of different parties, but it is uh, something that's very, very doable. You can't get, generally it's difficult to get federal historic tax credits for tax exempt entities that um, are like municipalities or whatever else, but if a for-profit is leasing to them, then you can structure it and make it work. So I can explain to you how that works a little bit later, because it is, it's a little bit of detail, a little bit of work to have done. Any other questions on this slide? So again, if you own your own home, if you have your own business in a building, it's 25% of what are considered to be qualified rehab expenses. If you're leasing it to somebody else, it's 50%. And then if there was a little bit of a hybrid, then you would probably take the, the, the credits that were applicable for your owner-occupied piece versus your investment piece. So how is the credit actually calculated? Um, so um, expenses for the project um, and how your credits are, are you take this 25% is based on what's considered to be qualified rehab expense. And so the vast majority of qualified rehab expenses are your building renovation. So that would be your HVAC, that would be your roof, uh, that would be drywall, um, that would be all your mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Basically anything that can make your building functional uh, is, is considered to be a renovation. If you have furniture, fixtures, and equipment, it's generally not. So if you had a cabinet um, that was not attached to the floor, then that would not be considered an eligible expense. So sometimes you actually find um, historic tax credit rehab developers who will find credits or find a way to attach them to the floor so that they can get um, to be considered to be eligible. Uh, there's a lot of tricks of the trade when you're kind of really trying to find ways to, to boost the qualified rehab expense. Um, but if you bought a property, um, that, that acquisition price would not be considered to be part of your qualified rehab expenses. Any site work that's done, so if Oak, when Oakcrest bought this building and they had to do, if they had to put in a parking lot, that's not considered to be uh, qualified. If you put in an addition, so if they wanted to put a new you know, 10,000 square foot addition, those are not um, considered to be qualified expenses. Your architectural fees are qualified. Um, your construction interest not your principal, but your interest is qualifying. Uh, and then there are other things generally, um, if it's considered to be for accounting or tax purposes to be capitalized, um, a capitalized cost, then it's, it's generally a qualifying expense. Yeah. John, crazy question, but in Strasburg, I'm looking at a, a building that happened in a theater. Mm -hmm. So it's got a slow floor. Yep. And federal may not like it, but if, for, if it gets back to site work, you know. Yep. We're, we're flattening the floor as we speak with hand labor. That's internal site work, internal. so that, that would probably be okay, okay if they approved what you're doing. Yeah. Site work generally, what I'm, what I'm referring to there is inside. anything exterior. Yeah. So landscaping, um, right. if it's not part of the actual building, uh, it's not generally. So, But facade improvements, if you're um, you know putting up stucco or new brick or repointing or putting in windows, that's generally considered to be an eligible expense. And all of that's kind of found, if you're doing this on your own, it's all, it's all found on the, uh, the Department of Historic Resources website about what are considered to be eligible and what are not. But if you're working with an architect or an architectural historian, they'll generally know or a consultant like me. Ed? Is, uh, 
the site work exclusion still apply for a historic site when the site itself has significance? Uh, yes. Generally, if it's anything to do with dirt, it's generally excluded. <laughs> uh, it's just a, it's a yeah, it's a, because when you when you do this and you're actually and the reason why this is structured this way, when you actually determine your amount of qualified rehab expense and you you get your credits, you're you're you're, you're going to depreciate that value. And most buildings, commercial buildings or residential buildings, are depreciated over 27 years or 39 years. Site work, um, furnitures, fixtures, and equipment are uh, depreciated over a, a quicker period. So it, that's kind of the differentiation. They really want it to be a capital piece of the building. Does somebody else have their hand up? Okay. <laughs> Any questions on that? So, so QRE, if you hear me say QRE or hear, hear anybody talk about QRE, that is the eligible expenses that you are incurring that are, you're able to use the 25% or the 20% for, for tax credit purposes. Um, and then when you're submitting back to the Part 3, um, most, for, well, for all federal projects, um, an, an independent third-party accountant firm has to actually audit 100% of your expenses for um, any federal historic tax credit project. In Virginia, any project under $100,000 generally is um, exempt from that. And then anything over $100,000 does require the same audit. So, for example, I work with Ian Hyde and Barbara a lot. They, they, they actually have to come in and look at all your invoices, and then they, they make sure that they're eligible or not eligible. And then that gets reported to the state, um, Department of Historic Resources, and then the National Park Service. And then that would, you, back to your question, Jeff, your, your credit investors would want to make sure that that's in place because that's then how much they're going to actually pay into the, to the partnership based on that final credit amount. So a lot of times you'll start your projects, and when we're working with projects, or when I'm doing my own, I'll estimate how much I think the credits are going to be, but you won't know until this audit's actually finished and completed, and that's all finalized. So any questions on this? This is really an important piece of this for whether you're a homeowner or you're doing a commercial project. Um, and then to monetization of, of credits, so um, if you are a tax-exempt entity or you, you have a commercial project and you want to be able to monetize the credits, um, or you don't have enough of an obligation, uh, there's ways to structure these where you can have um, uh, partnerships with people who may want to be an investor in the deal. Um, and for economic purposes, they also have to have some upside based on their ownership. Um, but there are ways to have them come into your partnership so that they can uh, basically contribute capital for your credits, but they're an investor in the project and then they get credits. So, for example, if you were doing, if Byron was doing a deal in Strasburg and he said, okay, I'm going to generate $200,000 worth of tax credits. I can't use them all. I want to find a partner who may, can, can use some of those. And let's say they agree on a price of $0.50 cents for the credits. So this partner would enter into the partnership with Byron, own whatever percentage that they deem to be reasonable. If they pay $0.50 cents on the dollar for a partnership enter, or for the credits, that if they're getting $100,000 of credits, then he would they would contribute $50,000 to the project. And then the project can use that to pay down debt or to do whatever else they can. But they are part of that LLC or whatever ownership structure that they have, so they're just a normal partner like everybody else. The other thing is whenever you use credits, um, you are also reducing the amount of depreciation that you can use for your building because um, generally, because... The, the credits are a way for the, the government to subsidize a lot of your rehab work. So if you did, uh, if you had a $200,000 project and you had $100,000 worth of credits, you'd have to reduce your what's called your basis by $100,000. Um, but, but back to the tax exempt entity, that, that, that gets a little bit complicated, so I'll talk to you guys after this presentation. But if you're just a normal project, um, a commercial project, you can have investors who can participate directly in the partnership, and that's generally the best way to structure those. <coughs> Any questions on that? Um, and so in Virginia, the, the timing is a little bit different from the federal investor. Um, an, an investor, for Virginia purposes, generally can be in by the end of the calendar year of which the certificate of occupancy has been issued. Um, for partnership legal rules, you generally want them in as early as possible if you're going to use an investor. Um, but at a minimum, uh, they have to be in by the end of the year or when the certificate of occupancy is issued. Uh, and then who can claim the credit? Again, Commonwealth of Virginia has less restrictive rules about who can use the credit compared to some other states. Uh, a lot of states, um, 
only insurance companies can use the credits, so it's actually a, a, an insurance company rebate that they have. In Virginia, if you pay Virginia tax, you're eligible to use Virginia tax credits. Um, to talk about federal investors just for a minute, so the same thing, um, whenever they're placed in service, um, it's generally deemed by the certificate of occupancy or a temporary, occupant, temporary certificate of occupancy or the actual occupancy. Um, tax credits for federal tax credit investors can be used, um, they can actually, they have to be um, used in the, the year of the certificate of occupancy, but if they have excess, so let's say you had $500,000 worth of credits, but you only had $100,000 worth of tax liability, you could actually go back to the preceding year and actually get a refund from the government um, if you're using federal. That's not, in Virginia, again, you can only go forward, you can't go backwards. Is there a lower limit? The tax credit eligibility has nothing to do with the investor. Um, it generally has to do with the, um, I mean, you, if, if you're doing a, com and I'm just going to talk about commercial projects. So if I have a commercial project and um, let's say I've got $100,000 worth of credits, so I've got to find somebody or find some folks who have $100,000 worth of tax liability. So they may not want to put in that much money if you're only going to offer them 5 or 10%. They may want a much larger stake. So it just, it's really depending on the partners that you have about how much they're willing to pay and how much ownership interest they have. So the, the, the credits are available and eligible to the partnership. It's just finding those partners that you want to work with because this is a marriage, and so um, they're actually entering into your partnership with you that will own the building. And so you have to kind of think through that before you, you, you do get investors. Does that make sense? So, like for my building that I'm working with, um, I, the investors that I'm going to participate with, I've worked on with other deals. So, you know, they'll have a small percentage of the ownership, but they'll be able to get the credits, um, but I can kind of still control the, the ownership. And they were fine with the amount of ownership that they get. But they, are, you know, they, they, they get a K-1 every year from the partnership for, for their tax return. If there's cash flow, from my rentals, then they'll get the cash flow. If there's a loss, they, they absorb the loss. So they're real legitimate, um, honest to goodness partners. Yeah. So that kind of concludes my presentation. I, I did want to show some examples of projects in the city of Winchester. Um, a lot that actually Shock has participated in, just for um, you all to kind of see some of the projects that have happened downtown and a couple of them that I've participated in. And then I'll open it up for any other questions. Again, I told you I was biased, so I'm only showing the city of Winchester projects. So the building that we're in, um, that was a tax credit project. Um, without tax credits, this couldn't have been um, completed. Um, and so um, that, that took some time, but this was a, a shocky project, and it's turned out fantastic. Uh, the, the Lovett building that's downtown in the mall, um, that's also an Oakcrest project. Um, but again, they used historic tax credits would not have been able to, to complete this without the economic incentives from tax credits. Um, the Union Bank, or the, the old Union Bank building, which is now the Union Jack, again, they used tax credits um, and were able to do a fantastic job. Uh, let's see, what else? The George Washington Hotel, they used uh, historic tax credits and they also used something called new market tax credits. Um, and without those, again, this project would not have been able to be completed. I think Kimberly's actually may have used some historic tax credits. And this was a smaller project. I, I believe they did actually, it's offices, and they did use historic tax credits. So as you see, there was only $58,000 worth of construction costs, but they were able to use state credits. And then this is the project that I did um, with Our Health for Our Health Phase 2. That was a shocking project. Um, that was a, a complete uh, federal historic, um, state historic, and new market tax credit project. So. That was a, uh, about an 11-month project, and without historic tax credits, we would not have been able to complete that. Um, we, we work with a lot of churches and tax-exempt entities, um, municipalities who can also use credits. Um, First Presbyterian opted not to, but um, this could have been an eligible historic tax credit project. And then the, some of the renovations on the South Kent Street. And then this was where Jan Hyden Barber now has an office, um, the old Perk Fitness building. 
So those are some examples of, of projects that have you know, happened in the city of Winchester that have been impacted and really been able to be an economic uh, you know, stimulant for the rest of the area. And, 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 and that's what I find to be for tax credits. It's a way to preserve our history, but it's also a way for us to subsidize um, or provide an economic incentive to do rehab projects for existing buildings that may not normally be able to be renovated. So um, with that, um, if I've missed anything or you guys have any questions, I'd be feel free to open it up. You mentioned that Virginia is kind of tops in the nation. Mm -hmm. What about the surrounding states, West Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina? Do they have robust programs? Or so I'll start with Maryland. Maryland has um, a 10% credit instead of 25%. So you see Virginia has a better credit. Um, Maryland also is a competitive credit market. So you actually have to apply to Annapolis to be selected. In Virginia, if you meet all of the rules, you get your credits. In Maryland, you could go through all the processes and still not potentially get credits. So it's a competitive process. And in Maryland, they found that a lot of projects were being completed in Baltimore, so now they have set-asides for other uh, uh, localities. West Virginia has a 10% credit. Um, there aren't as many projects in West Virginia that we've seen utilize them, but I, we have participated in one or two. Um, and then North Carolina has a very robust uh, pro uh, tax credit program. They probably have the, I'd say Virginia and North Carolina probably have the you know, top two or three. They have a mill credit. So if you renovate old mills, you can actually get 30% credits. Um, but their program is a little bit different for ours for regular credits, where they actually require you to spread the credit out over a period of years. So in Virginia, you get all your credits in the year that you're finished and you got your occupancy. In North Carolina, I think it's either three or five years. So it's not as good, but it's good for different types of buildings. Are North Carolina and West Virginia competitive like Maryland? They're not. They I don't believe so. I think that they're basically living if you complete that. Yeah. What other questions can I answer? I know it's a complicated topic. I know a lot about it, so I want to make sure I, I kind of get it to what, what is understanding. Is there, is there ever any uh, issues with the funding being, being available, not being available for the uh, tax credits? From the, from the state and the federal the side? The um, Virginia has... <laughs> because it's been a leader, has been always a strong supporter in the General Assembly. Um, Jill Holtzman-Vogel this year was very instrumental in doing some things that were actually strengthening the program. Uh, periodically, there's, there are, are some folks who want to make it come up for renewal every five years. That's been defeated, <coughs> um, which is great. She, she, was, she worked really hard to help us out with that. Um, in the federal level, um, Tax credits are considered to be tax expenditures, so they don't spend the money directly like they would on a road, but you are spending it through the tax code. But they found that because of the economic development impact of tax credits, that it actually generates more tax revenue than it does in, in what's considered to be the tax spending. So um, I think all projects like tax credits are always going to be looked at because it's a way for governments to um, you know, have more tax revenue. But at least now they've, they've determined it to be an economic stimulant. And I think if you look at the amount of construction jobs, if you look at projects that may not have ever been started or completed, um, and I think if you look at especially cities that couldn't do a lot of these projects without tax credits, they found them to be, um, you know, not not only necessary, but you know, without it, they, they wouldn't be able to survive. The new market tax credit is program mm -hmm. that's something different from completely different, yeah. Is that a process as well, like you have to submit application? Is it, I guess my question is, is it beneficial if you're already doing federal and state? Is there an added benefit to um, use that? I will tell you that new markets are limited to low-income census tracts. Um, it's extremely competitive. There's a small amount of allocation that's eligible um, throughout the United States. So I'll, I'll talk to you all about it, but generally in Winchester, uh, it's getting tougher to do those projects because of the improved economy that we have. But it is directed towards low income. It's it's low income census tracts. Yeah, it doesn't. It's not mean low income housing. Yeah. Um, like the Our Health Phase Two, that was a new market tax credit project. The George Washington Hotel was a new market tax credit project. Those are the only two in Winchester that I'm aware of. Any other thing? Any other questions? John, if you don't mind going back to the, on the tax credits for federal, you yep. can go back a year. Yep. So if you just paid some taxes for last year, yep. 
you would still have to complete a project by December to go back and recapture? Well, what you do, so let's say that, just for simplicity, yeah. let's say you complete a project this year that yeah. has $100,000 in credits. Right. So for your 2013 credits, you'd actually have to exhaust your 2013 tax liability first. Right. So let's say for your $100,000 worth of credits, you only paid $50,000 in taxes. So you had 50000 surplus. For federal, you could go back to 2012 and apply it to whatever you had that you paid in taxes right. to get your rebate. Yes. But you have to use whatever year you're, you're finishing your project, you have to use, you have to apply first to that year for taxes, and then you can go back. Okay, but you, you'd still have to be finished by December on a project. For 2013, you, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you would need to have your certificate of occupancy. Right, in December. Yeah, by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, buddy.